Um, being, I'm, I'm being joined today by three incredible experts in our, in our subject matter, careers in B2B events. Um, first off, Ali Massey with Salesforce, uh, then Robert Vandepoem from, um, let's see, from Permutive, and lastly, Pam Lasley, um, who's also with us from Amerisource Bergen. Um, all have built incredible careers in B2B events, and we're just grateful to have you. So thank you guys all for joining us, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Terrific. Well, let's jump right in if you guys are ready. So we're going to start off today. Uh, we've got, got some topics we want to cover. First off, uh, just want each of you to maybe to walk us through um, what your job in B2B event marketing uh, entails and what is your role and responsibility with your organization. And maybe if Pam, you could start us off. That'd be terrific. Sure. Um, so I am the event marketing manager with Amerisource Bergen. Amerisource Bergen is a um, large healthcare company. Um, we have about 22,000 associates globally, and we essentially specialize in the movement of medicine. So you can think of us almost as the FedEx of the, the healthcare world. We are the ones that take the medication from the pharmaceutical companies um, and make sure that it's distributed um, around the world. And we have about um, 200 events that we do across the year um, the calendar. Um, that includes our own internal summits, which I am heavily involved in, as well as our third party conferences and trade shows that we participate in. So we have a pretty robust calendar, but I am essentially the person who's juggling quite a bit of that, um, as, as well as my colleagues that, that I work closely with. So, yeah. Thank you, Pam. Rob, you wanna go next? Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm Rob and I'm, uh, I'm based in London the UK. I saw someone is also from the UK, at least the attendees. Uh, so thank you for joining. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, thinking of planning and executing events for our customers and prospects in Europe and North America. And our target audience are people working in the online advertising ecosystem. So publishers, media agencies and brands. And a great deal of our event activities take place at trade shows, which we sponsor. And uh, this year, as we've been working with Alina Budget, we've been hosting a lot more of our own events. And lots of what I do has to do with collaboration and stakeholder engagement internally. So your own sales team, your own customer success team, product marketing and demand generation, but also external when it comes to industry trade bodies and uh, customer advisory boards, for example. And uh, lastly, I wanted to mention that I see it as my responsibility and I believe we all have we're making sure that our speakers lineup is diverse. So we hit standards when it comes to women's representation, non-white community, and making sure that junior people in the industry are giving a platform too. Thank you, Robert. All right, Allie. Great. Well, I um, am the senior manager of executive events for our small and medium business segment at Salesforce, which is a SaaS technology company um, focusing in customer relationship management software. Um, so my role is really specific in the fact that um, we work with customers, our current customers or prospects who are farther down the um, marketing funnel um, and really helping to accelerate sales deals um, and close those deals versus my counterparts on my uh, marketing team who focus on more of like prospect and awareness brand building events. So um, I, in my role, I'm very closely assigned, uh, aligned to sales similar to Rob, um, huge important stakeholder. And, um, and yeah, that drives everything we do in terms of ROI and the, the KPIs we measure. Excellent. Thank you. So I think uh, a, a big question foremost on many of these students and, uh, and other attendees' minds is how did you find your way to a career in B2B events? And I'd, I'd love to start off with Ali since we, we put you at the tail last time. Let's get you to start this one. Sure. So um, I love telling the story. I have loved events for as long as I can remember. And that really started with the fact that my mom, who has also um, had a very long career in marketing and advertising, um, she threw me and my sister the best birthday parties. Um, and these were before the days of Pinterest. So she'd go and like get books out of the library. And that just um, instilled a love in me for bringing people together, having a really amazing experience. Um, so in high school and college, I started doing um, events through student council or my community service sorority I was a part of. Um, but 
for my studies, I actually was uh, focusing in the field of public relations, which of course does um, sometimes include events as well, but a full um, you know, range of other day-to-day -day activities. So as I was doing more and more um, client events as part of my PR job, I really gravitated back toward it. Um, I, I really wanted to focus on like, how do I get back full time into events? And there was an opportunity at my PR agency I was at to build kind of a role for myself doing B2B events, not only for the clients, but for the agency itself. So I was activating for our, for our own clients at um, big events like South by Southwest or CES or some in the healthcare field. Um, and it turned into an amazing career and got me to uh, connecting the dots to the place I am now at Salesforce. Thank you, Holly. Uh, let's see, Robert, you want to go next? Sure. Um, my story is, is less exciting, I think, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I stumbled into this career. Um, I was trained as a teacher and um, quite a long way around I ended up working for a tech startup in London and the UK and they wanted to help uh, they want to help raising awareness for their product and services in the US and events were and still are a great way of raising brand awareness for your services in new regions um, so um, as, as for any startups who, who need some help I just jumped in and, and started doing it um, and that was almost six years ago yeah so there you go great I think that's relevant. You know, it's not always a straight route to what we do. So I love, I love hearing the, the roundabout stories. My own is similar. So Pam, we don't want to forget about you. How'd you get to us? Yeah. Um, so I um, majored in business in school and I always tried to dabble in a lot of those extracurricular student council activities. And I think that's where I kind of got a feel for my interest level in events. Um, and then I um, got out of school and wanted to focus in on marketing, right? So fundamentally, I'm a, a marketer, like at my core. And I always thought that events would be something that would kind of be just sprinkled throughout. Um, and I also say that I was um, wanting to specifically focus on working at agencies. So when I got out of school, I immediately started working in the healthcare field with a pharmaceutical ad agency and stumbled through that a bit, right? It, it felt like it was supposed to be the right thing, but it wasn't kind of clicking. And so I ended up actually doing a little bit of a bounce around with some of the different agencies early in my career where I eventually ended up at an event agency that did a lot of tours and festivals and grassroots um, specific event executions and activations and when they downsized, I had an opportunity to accept a position that moved me in-house or, or, or into the corporate side. And I think that was where everything just kind of clicked. And I, I started working at a, a, an automotive business that was an offshoot of the Auto Trader brand, so autotrader.com. And it just made sense, right? I think I wanted to be in marketing and I wanted to do events, but it just was a better fit for me to be in the corporate side. And since then, I've been able to really navigate through a couple of different roles and um, grow in that, that event space and still kind of keep marketing very close. But to know that my focus is making sure that it's about executing these really cool experiences and activations and bringing them to life. So, um, yeah, just had to kind of, you know, figure it out. It, it didn't automatically, you know, just make sense from the very beginning. And, and um it may not for, for a lot of people, just keep that in mind. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love, I love hearing about all the intersections. We, we all know it happens, but uh, it's, it's a, great, a great way to take base with the, the students that are coming at this from all those different places, from marketing, from teaching, from a variety of sources. I hear that all the time. So uh, the inevitable question, we are now in the time of COVID. So how has that changed? Uh, how has your role maybe changed in, in, in today's world as opposed to pre-COVID? I'd love to hear from all you guys and uh, start off maybe Rob, grab this one first. Yes. Um, so for me, it really changed in, in three ways. So firstly, uh, before March this year, my role was 100% focused on in-person uh, physical events. And I'm grateful I was able to lead the events program to go 100% online. So 
rethinking formats um, in which you stop thinking about your attendees as full day delegates it was quite a journey. Uh, fortunately, I have um, I had a, I have amazing colleagues and communities such as this to help me figure it out. And um, secondly, we've also increased our online presence beyond events and launched our own weekly podcast in which we interview inspiring guests from our industry and beyond. And this is really like a step in becoming more of an events and experiences team, which I'm really excited about. I stole that. Um, I borrowed. Sorry, I borrowed that. Uh, that events and experience team handle from Google. Um, thirdly, when, when COVID-19 hit, my company decided to take a different sales approach called account-based marketing. And that means that my events that were focused on lead generation and sales acceleration were no longer aimed at everyone in the market, but and, and not about throwing a wide net, but just, of, just limited to a list of top tier prospects. So it's about catching just that one kind of fish. So those three things really changed for me. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Pam, you feel like going up next? I can. Oh, Ali, go ahead, please. Okay, I can jump in there too. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, the, this pandemic has just kind of brought to light how crucial events are in our society. And that's all kinds of events from social, um, to just gathering with your family, but I think we're very fortunate in the B2B industry that there are pockets of it that are actually um, flourishing right now. And, you know, I don't take that lightly that a lot of my colleagues and, um, you know, personal connections in social event worlds have been struggling right now. But at the same time, we're seeing a lot of trends um, in kind of this field marketing type of event role that are really expanding because of that proximity to sales and really um, influencing business. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest takeaway that I've had is um, like Rob, I, we were, my team was hundred percent in person prior to this. Um, we, we really focused on these intimate kind of in-market events where we would go to a city find our customers and top prospects in that city and invite them, and, and this is focusing solely on executives, invite them to a very VIP type of dinner or experience. Um, but there was always that level of intimacy. Um, so now we've just taken that and not just taken it because it is, you know, you certainly have to adjust for virtual, but we have been able to bring that 100% virtual and keep that intimate nature with things like virtual hospitality experiences or virtual round tables. Um, but from that high level of engagement. So, um, so yeah, I think similar seeing those kind of like account-based trends and getting like very focused in the exact customer you're trying to reach with the event. Yeah, I'll just echo that. Um, so uh, we, we actually took all of our programming that is normally live and we moved it to a virtual platform. We actually took the initiative to um, build out our own, um, just the, the healthcare industry is so um, closely a, a private and, and we wanted to have everything housed in one space. So we actually created our, our own platform as like this library where we would keep our virtual events while we were simultaneously taking our live annual summit and putting it onto these you know, li this live stream platform. So we have, in October, we executed um, our uh, one of our internal summits. We also did one um, in September as well. So we've executed two programs that have now been moved to those online platforms, had, you know, panel sessions. We've done a virtual exhibit um, really just taking all those components and putting them onto that, that platform. Um, I actually just started this role in, in July. Um, and um, I can speak to a little bit more about the whole, that whole process of starting a new job during COVID because um, that is, a, an, is, is interesting in itself. But um, so I'm really kind of learning about our customers, how they tick, what their interest levels are all really virtually. Um, we have, you know, had to really rely on those like personas and, you know, understanding, um, you know, the demographic really well without interacting. And that's something that's very new to me. You know, I've been in events for about 15 years now, and these are those 
first opportunities to really do it without being super hands on. And it's it's still a new it's it's definitely a new landscape and I'm learning. But um, yeah, so I, I'm, you know, as we continue to put our programs together for 2021, I'm, you know, kind of doing it all with out having a chance to like, you know, meet our customers, talk to them, understand what they like, what type of programming they prefer and having to do a lot of that like survey and research and feedback gathering on the back end. So it's a really interesting dynamic, I think, to to have to do all that without having that face time. Um, it's, it's new, uh, but interesting nonetheless, so. Yeah, I think everybody's getting that core skill of being able to pivot in the moment you know, really, really be a fast reactor. This is, this is where the, you know, the rubber beats the road these days. So that's mm -hmm. all. Awesome. Um, so I just want to loop back over to Allie. Allie, I know that you just finished up Dreamforce, which is a, a major annual event for, for your company. And I'm just curious, you know, such a massive undertaking. Can you share maybe what that was like, bring that into a virtual environment? Certainly. So um, just for anyone on the call who's not familiar with Dreamforce, it's one of the largest um, tech events in the world. Um, about 200,000 people descend on San Francisco every year, except for this year, obviously, um, for a user conference. There's um, a lot of excitement involved, a lot of uh, just like we call it Dreamforce magic. Um, so obviously translating that to virtual is really, really um, a challenge. And I want to clarify here that there is a whole ginormous team at Salesforce working on Dreamforce. And my part that I manage for the small and medium business team is like a very small but important part of Dreamforce. So our task actually was to figure out how best to serve our small business customers because they are very different than um, a lot of the other enterprise level customers throughout um, Salesforce. So kind of like Pam was saying, you really have to understand what's going to work for them in a virtual world. So um, we actually just hosted our first kind of conference virtually. I, I mentioned these intimate events that my team typically runs um, throughout the year, but we had about 200 people last Friday um, on a virtual conference, but we wanted this to be very like interactive and engaging. So we tried out a new tech platform. We had a lot of different types of content to engage with and we, um, we really went into it with the intention of making it an interactive event and facilitating those kind of magical moments that people could could meet someone else that's doing something similar to what they're doing. So I think that's the biggest learning for me is that, you know, you really have to go into it with that intention of you know, what you want to get out of the event. For us, it wasn't um, like a webinar style presentation. We wanted it to keep it intimate enough, you know, 200 people's kind of large compared to what we normally do, but it still felt intimate because of those connections people were able to make and that was very intentional. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, maybe Rob and Pam, I'd, I'd love to hear kind of what, what you guys have been working on uh, in this time of virtual events and Pam, especially since you've just made a pivot to a, to a new company, what's that, what's that been like? Um, it is, it is a great, crash course for sure. I, I, that's the best way to, to describe it. Um, yeah, I mean, we are, we're actively planning for um, another virtual event in February. That is our next um, big project. Um, we do another, we're doing another internal summit where we're bringing together all of our uh, manufacturer customers and prospective businesses to again, engage with us on that virtual platform, panels, sessions, keynotes. Um, but we are waiting in the wings and trying to effectively plan out what the end of 2021 is going to look like. We have, a, like I mentioned, a really robust calendar where some of our trade shows have already clearly moved to later points in the year or they've moved to this hybrid approach um, approaches that they would like to, to move to. So we are always seeing a ton of changes every single week on what the timing is going to look like and what the scope of work is going to look like and how do we effectively adjust for that. Um, I think what, what most event marketers or event uh, professionals know is that to effectively plan these shows, you need, you know, sometimes eight, 12 months lead time. So you really have to be thinking about 
what will my scope of sponsorship look like for this event in October? You know, what, you know, what type of product solutions are we going to be talking about in Q4 of 2021? Um, and it's still such a guessing game, but we're trying to effectively plan um, as much as we can for what that looks like. Um, I myself am just still trying to learn a lot about the business. So there's quite a bit of a learning curve there, but yeah, we are really looking um, pretty far out in terms of how we want to engage, uh, what our contingency plans, all those things are on the table daily for, for Amerisource Bergen. Excellent. Barbara, what about you? Yeah, it's actually, um, it's a fun one because we're in the middle of a trade show that's now going on and we've chosen to sponsor this three-day event. So this is day two, um, getting all kind of fun Slack messages, which, which I'm ignoring uh, until, until, uh, until this panel is finished. So it includes, uh, this sponsorship includes uh, underwriting a panel discussion. We are crewing a, a virtual booth, which is interesting. And we have access to a one-to-one -one matchmaking system that's been set up. For people who are interested, um, this trade show is working with the Hopin technology. Um, I don't have any, uh, I don't have any shares in Hopin, but there you go. Um, for the panel discussion, I've worked with the trade show organizer and my product marketing team and sales team to decide on the topic, and that's always fun to figure that one out. And also come up with a short list of potential panel guests and the moderator. And then uh, the trade show organizer and I teamed up to source the speaker and schedule in prep calls on which we walked through everyone through the panel that happened last week. Um, the prep calls are important. Um, conversations can go off the rails during the day. And um, yes, the, your sales team will not be entirely happy with that. Uh, you don't want to script it, of course, but uh, agreeing, un agreeing on a direction is, is really a must. And uh, we'll, uh, the panel uh, recording the panel will be recorded and we'll get it afterwards, which our sales team and the team can then use in their reach out to prospects. So it's also a great piece of content you have right there. Not only thinking about live attendance, but also on demand is, is, is really, really important nowadays with so much going on and people can log into so many events at the same time. And then we have the virtual booth, which is interesting. Um, so basically people go into a, a, your virtual booth and they, they are welcomed with a welcome message, a video. Um, and we worked on one, we worked with one of our customers to create a cool video. So we don't like, like you, you shouldn't, your face shouldn't be on the screen all the time. It should be the customers telling the story. So that's really important. And, um, I also worked with colleagues to figure out who would then crew our virtual booth as people get beyond the welcome message and what happens then and who can they talk to. And then we have the one-to-one -one matching system. Uh, which now is happening online. Uh, it's not It's not completely swiping right, but something like that. Um, the trade show organizer basically rewards attendees to take these meetings. And then if you, it's awkward, obviously, because people get, get rewarded to take a meeting. But if you can, can get past that awkwardness, you can have really meaningful conversations with prospects, especially if you have something valuable to add. So uh, yeah, that's going on these three days. And uh, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, handling uh, handling an event like this and, and dealing with these stakeholders. And I hope this gives you a little bit of idea about the uh, excitement that goes on even at a, 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 a smaller tech company like myself, like ourselves. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I, uh, the, the project manager in me geeks out hearing about all the, the planning and the, the pivoting and the communications and contingencies, all that good stuff. But I, I love that uh, our industry just thrives on that creativity. And even in this time of, you know, suck and wind in the virtual world, you know, we're all finding a way to make it work. So thank you guys all for, for contributing and, and telling us about kind of what you're working on. Um, I'm curious, this is kind of getting down in the dirt a little bit, but what's been the most difficult part for, for each of you uh, about throwing virtual B2B events in, in, in this virtual world that maybe not all of us anticipated. I know we all had our toes in it a little bit before this happened, but I know for me, it was a, it was a big flip. And, and I'm imagining for all of you guys, when it's your business on the line, it, it really changes the dynamic. Um, let's see, Pam, you want to start it off? Yeah, for sure. No, um, I mean, I think we all know that we not only have 
like the virtual fatigue, um, right? Everybody is online all the time, even for, you know, grandma's birthday, right? So we're online and how do we keep people interested and engaged in our summits and our events and not have them in the background tuning out because they're trying to help the kids figure out their homework or, you know, Zoom school. Um, so that level of engagement and keeping them 100% tuned in has probably been the biggest challenge in how to address the virtual world. Um, we, we, I think, can figure out, like, how do we adjust our content to make sure that it's appealing enough? But then we can also find these, like, really kind of, you know, uh, hokey ways to, like, send them gifts and, you know, uh, you know, provide them with little, like, tchotchkes just to have, you know, something that gives them all the feels. So we have such a wide variety of ways that we've been trying to figure out how do we keep them really, really interested and engaged for two hours, whatever may be the case, and that they're also learning quite a bit and we're getting the message across in the right way and that we are capturing the data that we need, right? We've got clear benchmarks, we've got clear KPIs. So when we deliver these post-show reports back to our executives, we've got to show that it was worth it. So all of that is like what keeps me up at night and trying to figure out how to like effectively make sure that that happens. Um, uh, I would also just add that virtual is such a new world in terms of production. I've never had this aspect of recording your keynotes two weeks ahead of time or, you know, you know, booking time for these general session recordings, like so far in advance. I think we're all at, we're normally so used to like getting amped up for the days of the event, right? And we just like knock it out. We like don't sleep. We go three, four days at a, you know, a convention center and that is gone. So having all of that like production adjustment has been super new and, and interesting um, for me. Again, I'm still, I'm a, I feel like I'm a student myself in all that, honestly. Excellent. Yeah, echoing that, just, I mean, the engagement is number one. How do you keep people interested? Um, and the other thing that I've seen, um, I was actually out on parental leave for the first uh, six months of the pandemic. Um, so I was kind of, I came back and was just trying to get up to speed on all of the different tech platforms that have added features and popped up just since um, COVID hit. And I think that for me has been just a struggle in just trying to keep up um, with the latest technology. So I've started to look at it as the tech platforms um, are your venues. They're your new venues and they require a lot of research and, and site visits, demos, if you will. Um, and just trying to corral that is just a very different, different things you have to think about when choosing that, um, where you want to host your event. So that's, that's been one of the more overwhelming aspects of it for me. Yeah, I think I'm echoing what Ellie and Pam is saying here. It's, it's engagement all the way. Um, thinking about how you can engage people uh, with bite-sized experiences. Um, I think it really helps for us to not be afraid to get really specific with your topics. As there's so much on offer right now, you can't allow yourself to be generic, uh, even though you, you might feel that you want to appeal to as many people as possible. I would actually say the opposite is, is more helpful. Uh, be an interactive, um, get the audience involved uh, during and before and after the events. Um, as, 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 uh, as Ellie mentioned, there are lots of uh, platforms out there that are trying to, to add more features to, and they're mostly focused on audience interaction. And lastly, um, when it comes to uh, boosting engagement, want to fly uh, the banner for diversity and inclusion again as... Um, events with the different perspectives from the industry are the most exciting and people tune in and get and are engaged. So I think these things are really important. Yeah. One note there too, just um, jumping on Rob's comment about diversity and inclusion, we've seen a lot in general being able to reach broader audiences through virtual. So um, our, our numbers have actually been 
better than our in-person events, um, specifically geographical um, diversity, which is, um, you know, typically we would go into obviously all the major markets for these in-person events um, and then hit some kind of like tier two cities. But beyond that, it was really hard to engage. And some of our biggest customers are manufacturing companies, small manufacturing companies, um, you know, in the Midwest and, and a in a small town and because we are now in this virtual world we are able to reach them and that's been a really big differentiator and something i think we're going to carry with us when um when in person does return right now you guys might have already touched on this a little bit but you know we're the story i'm telling in class is that hybrid and virtual is here to stay you know this is the new the new norm um, certainly we all hope to get back to in-person events but I think uh, what we'll see, and I think you guys might agree that hybrid is going to be a bigger part of that. So maybe uh, some advice, how would you guys steer event marketers? What should they be focusing on to get people engaged and get people interested in their events? What kind of tricks have you used? Rob, you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the, the tricks to use, um, so, so basically thinking about this time of continuous change, um, I think it's more important, uh, more important than ever, to have the willingness to put feedback loops into place. Like it, we call them, it's really hard for every, anyone to predict the right setup of hybrid or virtual event offering for your target audience uh, next month. Uh, who knows in, in a year? So it's 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 a time to give it a go and be brutally honest about what works and adapt. So if you look up top skills for event marketers. I Googled before the event and it, it, it has stuff like organization skills, budgeting capability, attention to detail and being a team player. Really important also in the new normal. But I think about the willingness to, to be wrong and the willingness to change and adapt is, is, is most important there. And perhaps a cheeky one when we go into the hybrid world is uh, you also need to have great communication skills to explain to your leadership that hybrid or even virtual events aren't necessarily cheaper to put on. Um, so um, hold your ground uh, and, and don't let them take away your budget. Ali or Pam, you got anything you want to add? I can quickly add. Um, I think for me, um, just going again back to the engagement piece of it, um, I would encourage, um, I, I work in B2B. And by no means um, have I had an opportunity to work on the B2C side, but I think that there's a lot of crossover with how people are consuming digitally these days. So I would encourage you to stay on top of what those digital trends are and stay ahead of trend on what those, on what those are. So, um, you know, while I don't think normally we would um, be super involved in uh, social media as you would see for a B2C event. It may work better in B2B being super engaging on social um, in that virtual setting. Um, we've you know, done projects where we have you know, cameo videos, which are super popular or finding like fun, cheeky ways to incorporate not necessarily a TikTok video, but something of a similar caliber, just because even if you are in a B2B space, that's how people are consuming digitally. So I would just encourage people to find a way to obviously stay polished in that B2B kind of mindset and understanding who your customers are and how much uh, you know they're, they're important to your business but they're just people as well. So right now when they're sitting at home, they are you know, more so in that consumer space than we think. So finding ways to um, utilize those really cool and innovative things that we're seeing digitally to engage with them has been really helpful for, for our brand that you know, we've seen work. Thinking just to add to that, I think what's really been helpful for us in the last couple of months is that we've utilized our events to start introducing or facilitating a conversation between our customers and their customers. So mm -hmm. as a tech company, you obviously 
we are in a fortunate position that we are the infrastructure that binds the online ad, the online advertising system ecosystem together. But uh, today, earlier today, we had a customer event uh, where we basically approached. Um, in, in this case, it was a media agency, um, and our publishers who work with us want to talk to the media agency because they can secure some some budget to have advertisement on their site, and that's how they can keep their business afloat. Uh, and we basically uh, uh, introduce, uh, allow um, our publishers to be connected and start a conversation. And actually we, um, we can go to a, a media agency or a brand and say, we have this group of publishers. Do you want to talk to them? Do you want to present something? Do you want to teach them something? And they all want to do that. So these events have been um, uh, unique in that sense is that uh, we, we get enormously good feedback that we just, bring those people together, we moderate it, but we step back and let the magic happen. And sometimes that's also a really good event. So I just wanted to add that in. Great. Excellent. Now, I think that's most important, making space for people to, to find their own connections. Um, so in the interest of time, because I want to try to get to some of our questions, um, there's kind of the top of the mind question that I know is on a lot of our students uh, who are attending and, and watching us now. Um, and I'd love to get this out there and get your, your advice. So what advice would you give to students and recent grads who are looking at this as a potential career path and in just, you know, a job in B2B events and, and, you know, how can they break in the industry? And even I'll wrap this, the, the kind of the next piece in, I'm an internship coordinator, you know, there's, there's fewer internships on the market. So what would you tell a student to do to, to make himself stand out or to find those really special opportunities um, that might get them the experiences they're, they're looking for and need? I can start out with this one. Um, I think kind of, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of what I've done in my career is kind of found these gaps that people were not paying attention to necessarily, but there was a need and carved out a role. So um, I did that in an internship I had early on as well. Um, I, I shared this story earlier with the, with the crew, but um, I, I got an internship, my first internship when I was 18 um, in college with a luxury brand, which to me didn't mean much at the time. Um, I wasn't super interested in that, but I was really interested in the fact that it was a PR or marketing internship. They told me I'd work in one of those departments when I got there. Um, I showed up on my first day and they put me um, on a team cataloging patents with the legal team. It was like a filing job. And I was like, this is not going to help me get to where I need to be in my career. Um, so a, a, another internship role within the same company opened up on the retail team, still kind of further removed from PR and marketing, but the unique thing was they were coordinating a lot of store openings and, um, a lot of the role was actually some internal communications with the people who were leading those, uh, meetings and the, the you know, the internal like, prep meetings and, and dinners before they did these major openings, which, um, you know, really translates into PR and events. And I took that and like really honed in on like really knocking those parts of the internship out of the park and then have continued to do that through, you know, other parts of my career. So just look for those, those gaps. Um, even if you're not in a role or an internship that's directly related to the industry, you may be able to get creative with it and find ways to add value with the skill sets um, you're looking to develop for being an event marketer. Yeah, anything for us, Pam? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'll quickly jump in. Um, I would absolutely encourage you to find a mentor. Um, that to me has been one of the most beneficial things, um, not, not only just to be able to latch on to somebody who's an expert at a particular industry, but there's so many things that are not written in or, or taught in classes in terms of like how to become more polished in the professional world, just like the, the the like street smarts versus book smarts like having a mentor is it's been very very valuable to me um they can help you really navigate where um you know you know what works best for your career and what doesn't um i wish i had somebody who told me like oh maybe the agency world is great but don't leave out the corporate side because that's where i had to figure out and learn the hard way that i really enjoy working in the corporate side um, I'd also encourage um, people to find like a top five brands to follow. 
um, I have like really, um, I would say like those na uh, household name brands um, like MasterCard and Samsung, and I've seen them do event marketing so well. And I love just keeping an eye on those top brands and not only following them for like the cool experiences and activations that they create, but also just understanding the brand stories that they're telling. Um, you know, you may see them at various trade shows as well. So find those like top five businesses that you just keep an eye on all the time and find out how are they executing? What are they doing? What type of colors are they, are they putting in their spaces? Or, you know, how have they found is the best way to like interact with their audience and really just keep an eye on those like as you continue through your career and, and your learning um, on how to maybe implement some of those really cool things that you're seeing in the industry and from those brands that you're following into your 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 jobs. They, they totally got it. So was, that, that's, that's out of the question that they got it. So no, nothing to add there. <laughs> Good. All right. So uh, before we go into some of the audience questions, um, let's get like a little fun answer from you guys. What can you share as one prediction for the future of events? What do you think the, the event, events industry is going to look like, say, post-COVID? I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I believe that those companies who are open about their goals on delivering a platform for diverse voices. So no more manos, please. And please have um, make sure that non-white communities are also able to share their voice. People, companies who do that are open about their goals and hold themselves accountable are the ones who will win. Also in B2B. I mean, in B2C, that's, it's, it's a given. You're out, you're canceled if you don't do that. But in B2B, it's super important because we have to realize in the events that we shape the industry. Like it's not just not just hitting sales targets and customer retention targets. It's also about shaping an industry. And um, that's what I think uh, what we all should realize. I can go. Um, I'll also kind of repeat a little bit of a theme I shared earlier, but I think small is the new large. You're going to see a lot more of a trend in these kind of micro events um, and intimate gatherings, even as we go back uh, into the new normal, especially just practicality wise, just the size of gatherings, um, you know, that are going to be allowed in various states or cities. Um, so start thinking about ways that you can, um, you can really translate if, if you're someone who's like had a, more experience in large scale conferences, how can you create those? I think Rob's used the term bite size too. Um, I think that's where we're really gonna see it going. And I'm gonna be the dark horse and say, it's gonna be our job to get people hungry for events again, right? We have to, um, get them back out out of the sweatpants get them into a place where they um feel ready to engage in those like i guess relatively large conferences i i totally agree with like the smaller intimate um engagements i think those are great um one thing i'm keeping in the back of my mind is especially with the hybrid approaches um somebody mentioned at a conference once how do we make sure that people who are just watching at home also feel like they're connected with um, what's going on live? And the answer was you don't, right? There is going to be a clear distinct distinguishment between what's happening live and what's happening if you're just watching some of the sessions at home. And I think as the creators behind that, we have to make sure that we're very clear on how we build out these conferences and trade shows so that we can offer a lot to a broader audience. But we still are showing people the value of being on site, seeing people face to face, seeing that engagement face-to-face, -face, letting them scratch and sniff our products and what, what that, the implications of that is. So I selfishly am ready to get back out there. So I think I will do my part to make sure that we, um, you know, get people excited about that again. I, I think I, I definitely, I definitely agree with what Pam said here as well. I think um, as a company, we, we, we're thinking a lot about 
what it would mean to throw these big conferences again. But I think what's important to realize, and I think it's also a stance that you can make as a company, is to think about uh, what getting on the plane again, yet again, mm. and, and not going local, what that means for sustainability, what that means for cost efficiency. Uh, I, I, I'm part of um, an association called Event Marketer Association. It's headquartered in, in London. And they mentioned uh, that just this year in 2020, um, internal corporate travel, Amazon as a whole company saved 1 billion US dollars. And the question is like, what does that mean? And what does it mean for sustainability to not to go micro, go local? Um, yeah, so that's a question I, I think that we all need to think about. And Ellie, uh, I think super, uh, uh, Pam as well, was super interesting what you mentioned about uh, online and uh, in-person events being totally separate when it comes to hybrid. It's it, you. I, I totally agree with you that and so it's, it, that's really, really helpful to think about it, think about it in that way. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, look, we have uh, a little bit of time for a couple of questions. So I'm, I'm trying to go through them all and find a couple that seem to, to pair up. Um, we had one question for Ali and another one for all of you, I think are probably uh, could maybe echo some of the things you've said, but rephrase it a little bit. So uh, the original question was, you know, the, the camaraderie, the connections are so critical um, to success. What are you doing to, to make sure that experience is effective and that you're, that you're getting that same connection out of a virtual event? And uh, as a second question echoed in the q and is, you know, what are some of the unique and fun experiences you've incorporated into your virtual events to make it stand out a little bit? So maybe if you've already talked about one of those, you could kind of kick off on the other. But what's, what are you doing to keep the connection alive and what are you doing to make it fun and exciting? anybody who feels like going. Well, I can I can start with some um, things we've been doing with our customers. Um, as I mentioned, we did a lot of dinners beforehand. Um, so we've now been doing what we call virtual hospitality and we've seen a lot of companies doing these types of things. A lot of agencies have pivoted to offering these types of experiences. Um, but honestly, we've just seen really big success still, even as the year has gone on with virtual wine tastings, virtual mixology classes, um, cooking, we're doing a fondue with family class. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of engaging with family members and putting that expectation in the invitation, which people have appreciated. So um, for those types, just kind of taking the focus off of the business and allowing people to connect. Um, I can't tell you how many survey results we've gotten that says like, I've just missed people and like just this was such a cool experience. And then the business comes, right? Like you, you create that magic, create that moment for people to connect. And it's not necessarily about getting there and talking about your product. It's about, hey, now next time your sales leader calls the customer, they're gonna answer because you just, you know, had involved their family in a really awesome experience and they appreciated, the, you know, breaking out of the routine. Um, I'd be interested to hear what the other panelists have seen too. I think it's really interesting, Ali. I, I had a great experience as well with uh, like uh, cooking and it was really cool because they only sent me the ingredients. Maybe they were making fun of me, but they only sent me the ingredients and there was one other person on the call who knew what we were doing and had to tell everyone else what we were cooking and talk us through it. Uh, hilarious. Uh, definitely recommend it. Um, I think um, I, I'm going to give a slight slightly annoying answer here but when it comes to fun and engaging experiences you know what's really worked for us having short experiences short presentations short clips of customers of ours telling that our product works like it's still the old-fashioned like yeah I, I totally agree with like with the, the experiences such as online uh, wine tasting is amazing uh, but I think that the most impact we've had and the most um, response we've had is from okay, um, this uh, you get we get you in the room with with, publish, with other publishers with other people who work with our product. You go and talk to them, or here's something you can look at. It's two minutes and explains why it works. And using these as like tasters or or um, um, yeah, it's it just it's just invaluable. Using using what you have just in, in your customer base is just incredible. Yeah, I think the key to that is just like. Rob said just to get like your champions in the room as well like to have that kind of magic happen and you just step back and let the customers talk to each other 
about what they're going through. I'll just quickly add, because um, I know we're short on time. Um, we found that, um, you know, we've we've tried to keep our platform as interactive as possible, and we wanted it to to be lim not to to limit it to just people are watching um, a stream for however long. So we've tried to implement within our tools like really cool ways to do polling and you know create word clouds and create chats and conversations so that there's still an opportunity to build some organic connection interaction. And we're allowing them to like, you know, stay active and not just sit and like watch the whole time. Um, one other thought is um, they, they have to step away and we want to encourage them to step away. So giving them through the mobile app, you know, really fun stretches or some yoga, fun yoga poses or, you know, take a, like a five minute calm break to just like do some meditation. I think we all are aware of kind of our circumstances. So encouraging those things have been really nice because then they still, you know, appreciate that almost to that same point. Um, you know, and they remember, oh, that, that was the conference that gave me like these really cool yoga to, you know, tips um, that I used, you know, between each session. So those are some just fun ways to also, um, you know, keep people interested. That's great. And uh, we are right at the end of our time. I just want to say thank you uh, to our panelists. This has, has been very enlightening. Um, I didn't get to all the questions. So those of you guys who maybe left a question I didn't get to, um, feel free to maybe reach out to Hannah and she, I'm sure she could she could pass you along to each one of us and uh, I know we'd all like to, to give you some some responses so I just want to say again thank you Pam thank you Allie thank you Robert for all for joining us and making time today um, I think it was extremely beneficial and, and really appreciate uh, the opportunity to chat with you guys. Thank you.